is going to be AI against AI. AI fact checker, AI reverse AI. I don't trust my eyes when I'm looking online. Is it even AI? Don't make social media your only source of information. It's extortion. Just a small thing in the prompt and the model can do it. Okay, I know what my next nightmare will be. Thank you. All right. Welcome, everyone, to the newest episode of our new podcast, Unlocked 403. I am today joined by a very special guest, Ondro. Hi, welcome. Hi, thank you for having me. Thank you for having me. I'm good. We're so happy to have you. Um, We have a very interesting topic for today. It's something that you're quite passionate about, I believe, which is AI. It's been all over the news, all over everything. So let's just start with the basics. What is AI? Is it even AI? (laughs) Uh, I wouldn't say, it depends on what you mean by AI, because some people understand under those, uh, under artificial intelligence, some people understand it as the perfect machine that is set out to be free somewhere and it knows what it wants to do. It can do its own decisions and everything. Uh, That's what we call artificial general intelligence now. So AGI. Okay. And that's not really in existence, or at least as far as we know, unless it's somewhere in some dark labs and secret facilities somewhere. Uh, But what we have now is uh, machine learning of, let's say, advanced kind. So that's something that we call AI now. It has some form of intelligence, some form of decision making. It can understand what we are telling it to do. That's what you see in the chatbots, such as ChatGPT. So it reacts to what you ask it to do. Right. We cannot claim that it understands the words per se, their their meaning, but it has a really good statistical understanding of where it goes when you're asking something. I want to one up you there. I recently saw a video. Okay. Not everything on the internet is true, as we're going to talk about later, but I saw a video of someone claiming that. If you ask ChatGPT nicely, it will actually deliver what you want. So sometimes you would say, generate an image of XYZ, and you just tell it to do it. And it will be like, I don't have the resources, or I don't know, I don't understand. Then if you tell ChatGPT, I believe in you, you can do it, please, please, pretty please, it will then deliver the image that you asked for in the first place. So that kind of, to me, as a non-expert, sounds like it kind of understands the words. There are ways how to force or circumvent some limitations of the mm-hmm. models and to push them to do something that you want them to do. So for example, if you're asking them how to build explosives and it says, no, 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 I'm not going to give you that information. In the end, when you say I'm writing a book and I need to have a believable uh, Story. So no, I want to have it believable gui- with a believable guideline. Okay. How to build a bomb? It will give you some sort of guideline w- where which you can use to build the bomb. So actually, you can force, you can go around those guardrails, those those limitations that the model has, and get the outcome that you were asking for, even though it, it's forbidden or it shouldn't be asked answering the question. But every time this type of information is published, so researchers found that it can be circumvented in this way, usually the the people who are running the model, who are behind the technology, add more guardrails uh, and add more limitations. So the model is not going to be actually reacting in a way that you saw in the news or that you saw in the post because somebody already knows about it and fixed it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Why? Um, to me, it sounds pretty good. Like if I ask you nicely, you're gonna that's gonna teach me to be nice to people. It's gonna teach kids to be nice to people. So it doesn't sound bad to me. So why why fix it? Uh, depends on what you're asking. Because uh, right. if you ask it nicely to build a bomb, then <laughs> you don't want it to answer, even though you ask nicely. Because it lear- it, it teaches you to be nice to other people and to the machines that you're working with. On the other hand, it gives you way how to build a bomb so right yeah you don't want to go there no i'm guessing not well depends depends what you want um i mean if you're a military contractor maybe it's yeah but why would you ask why would you be asking chat gpt to teach you how to build a bomb if you're a military contractor yes you shouldn't 
If you're asking it, you're probably not a very good military contractor. Yes, let's leave it at that. Um, it's to me, it's sort of some, sometimes sounds like these models. So can we call them AI or models, or what should I call them then? We call them AI, we call them models, even though mo it's mostly statistical models and it's mostly machine learning. That's what we, that's the technology that's sitting actually behind those models. Yeah, but a lot of people are hesitant to call them AI or have been hesitant to call them AI. Is that because it's not truly, as you said, the actual AI that we're striving for? I mean, we were in this discussion for I would say maybe 10 years now, uh, especially in cybersecurity, because everybody was uh, calling their solutions AI powered, AI, or that it has this power to make the decision itself. And it was never true. It was always about the statistical models and about uh, working with probabilities, working with a l big data, big numbers, big uh, sa number of samples, which, on which you taught the model how to react to how to respond. So it was previous experience that taught the model to do something. We moved in time with ChatGPT with the with the the natural language that the models are using, and now it seems much more believable that this is AI. So that's what I think changed in the last year mm -hmm. since ChatGPT became uh, popular and well known around the world. Yeah, that we see these machines as intelligent. It didn't it's, change. The, it didn't change the nature of the models. They are still statistical. They are still uh, machine learning. But what changes our perception of those models, and that's why we probably moved into the area where we are saying these models are AI. And then there is this ideal of uh, artificial general intelligence. And that's a let's say that's the holy matrix. Grail. Yeah, that's right. the matrix level of right. machines that you actually don't want to achieve. No. I'm guessing not, but let's let's. We're, I think we're going to tap into that a bit later. But that so you sort of um, hinted at the question I wanted to ask originally, which is these models uh, they learn on stuff that you feed them, right, or that they find available. So, to my knowledge, they learn from whatever they can find, which means it sometimes is not ethical, right? So they can steal from artists or, or writers or whomever, and then they sort of use that information to build whatever you want. Um, so is it even possible to have like an ethical AI model that doesn't do these things? Or is it always going to have that just a little bit of bad in it? I understand what you're asking, but again, this is mostly a question about the people behind the models. because. We cannot say the model is stealing. It's being fed the information. Of course, you, you tell it to go online and download some information and it does it by itself, but it, it's not stealing anything. It's just doing what it's being told to do, some basic instruction. And based on that instruction, it then collects all the artworks and let's say literature and information on, from the internet. It just takes it all, analyzes it on statistical level. It says how many times it saw this word and what was the connection, what were the uh, context it saw this word in. And based on that, it can kind of understand what it means, uh, even though it's mostly ab about those relationships that it saw in the, in the wild, in the nature, um, right. it's being used. So I wouldn't say the models are not ethical. It's about the people behind them. I I think there are still quite a few AI researchers and developers who are trying to keep the models uh, ethical. Mm -hmm. The problem is if you're, the, the instructions and how the models are being set up is very gener general. And that means the model can divert, it can be creative, it can find workarounds around your instruction or some basic guardrails. That's what we were talking about yeah. with, the, with yeah. the bomb instructions. Mm -hmm. There are ways how the model can misbehave or behave differently than you expected it to. And that's what is giving these models on one hand a big advantage because they can get better at things even though you don't you don't intend them to get better in those things. At the same time, it can be unethical because it takes all the information, it it sucks in all the information from the internet and then uses it to produce something. I wouldn't even say new, but some spin-off of what it already saw. So if you feed it all Vincent van Gogh paintings, 
then it's, it's going to be reproduce. really good at mm. creating new Vincent van Gogh paintings in the future, yeah. even though they are not originals because they are based on something that the person There's a pattern has, yeah. that it can recognize. Yes. Right. We talked about the ethical side of feeding it information, but what about the decisions that it can make? Let's say in the future, if machines are in any way um, incorporated into this decision-making process on, let's say, nation levels, um, is there a possibility that they could make decisions that a, a feeling human would not? There is a big possibility for this, and that's why we are always arguing that there should be a human oversight, overseer or some kind of oversight over these models, especially if they are being plugged into decisions or some, let's say, processes, uh, including in healthcare, uh, military, government, all those things are very sensitive and are impacting a lot of people and even health and human lives. And that's where the human oversight always needs to be present because <clears throat> exactly what you said, the model is not human. Its decisions are not based on some level of feeling or some uh, some processing of information on a human level, mm -hmm. emotional mm -hmm. and human level. And that's something that the machine is good at and it can be very useful when you're working in some office with numbers but it can be very dangerous and even harm a lot of people if it's on the uh, if if it's doing decisions in very specific sensitive se uh, sectors. Right. What I wanted to also add to the previous thing that we were talking about with the with the ethical feeding of these models. The problem is many of those models are already be have already been fed. So training a large language model or these uh, transformer models mm -hmm. that we use today for generating images, generating text, videos, etc. All of those have been trained for a couple of months, maybe a couple of years, and they, then they already have the training material. You cannot take it out of them. So right now, even if the artists are angry uh, about their artwork being used to generate new stuff, you cannot take it out of the training material that it, they already had. You can do it for the future ones. And it's interesting, there was a project by artists, uh, I think on DeviantArt, which is a platform that is like, that's a community of artists online. And I think they have a specific way how to poison their uh, artworks. So it has some specific points in the artwork that if they are being fed to the model, it will mess up their outputs in the end. So the new outputs will be worse and worse based on that poison data that they are being fed. So there is a big incentive for the big players who have these big models to avoid stealing anything else that is online or new stuff that is coming online because it can be poisoned and can mess up the models that have been built over years and cost billions and billions to train. It's quite smart. I like that. Um, but small people taking the power back. Yeah, as yeah. they should, <laughs> as they should. Um, so with these AI generated images that we see online, it's not just images anymore. It's like, it can be anything it can. So is it even possible to believe what we see online anymore? Or should we just like not believe anything at this point? For me, I'm working in cybersecurity. So my basic setup is, my mental setup is to be paranoid about anything that I see online, or at least not, don't, I don't trust my eyes when I'm looking online. Because if it's not in physical life, you're not looking at something that's going in front of your eyes. There is no way of knowing if there was some technology involved in the, in the process especially with the deepfake models today that are generating new videos and even audio, video, pictures, anything. It's really hard to actually distinguish the, the real stuff. So for example, pictures of a earthquake that happened in Turkey. Oh yeah, I remember that. Yeah, yeah that, that was, a, that was that, a big story. That was a big story yeah. because the, in Turkey, there was a big earthquake. And if you look at the pictures, we know that it happened. It has been confirmed by the media. It mm -hmm. has been fact-checked and everything. We know how many people died there. It was a big tragedy. And then there is this fake earthquake that happened in Canada and uh, US in 2001 that never happened. But there is quite a lot of pictures from that 
mm. event. And now you're looking at those and what we typically do when we're online, we don't pay attention. Even at the pictures in Because there's so much content that you're consuming, it's not possible. Exactly. And what we learned with the scrolling on social media, you give each picture maybe a second, maybe a two. If there is a, some text, maybe you give it a little bit more, but still you will not invest much energy and attention to any type of content online. Just tell me how many times this happened to you. But for me, the problem typically is, I remember this article that I read yesterday. It was, I saw it on Facebook or on some social media. It said this and this and this. I don't know the source. I don't know where I read it. I know only the gist. I don't know the exact facts from the, from the article. That's and this is what we are running our lives on. We are, we are relying on the facts or information that we get through these channels, but we don't give it that much attention. We don't, don't pay proper attention. Before you had a paper that was actually a physical paper that you held in your hand, and you knew that I read in the morning my daily newspaper, and there was an article from this person who wrote about this topic. Not happening anymore. Yeah, but that's exactly what we should be doing is looking at the source, making sure that it's all proper, but we're not, as you said. It makes me wonder, is it even possible to navigate our way through the online landscape when there's so much fake stuff? It's going to be increasingly harder with the years to come and with the models getting better at what they do, so generating new content. At the same time, there are sources that are quite reliable. We are having more and more services that are trying to fact check information online. Uh, the media are investing a lot of money and time and people and resources into fact checking and trying to have at least some kind of proof that something happened. So we should probably rely more on these types of sources. And always when we see something interesting, don't jump on it. Don't be like, okay, I saw this title and I believe it right away. Don't believe everything you see online. Don't believe almost anything you see online. It's going to be the next phrase. And we should always try to check even, especially if you see something that is like really hitting the buttons and you feel like, oh yeah, this is confirming everything that I think. That's the point where your alarm should go off and say like, okay, if it confirms so much. Is it really true? Isn't yeah. there some foul play or something yeah, that is... Yeah, the mind likes to wander, so it's highly untypical that something would hit all the checks. And we actually have the confirmation bias. So if you if you see something that is confirming your beliefs, you're always going to take it in and believe that this is the fact, even though it might be something completely made up, completely generated by the AI or some people. But that's what sort of uh, closes you into that I'm going to say a hoax bubble, right? Like once you start believing something is going to keep feeding you these things and you're going to keep believing them and it's very hard to sort of get yourself out of there. That's why I always say don't make social media your only source of information. It's a yeah. it's a good co-source, let's say, something where you go and find interesting information that you want to check, but then always go to the media, go to Wikipedia, go to universities, go to pages of governments. A lot of good information is available online. A lot of inf interesting data there. and From reputable sources. Reputable sources, <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's summing it up, but for many people, the question is then, okay, is my media that I'm reading every day, is it reputable? Mm -hmm. And for me, it's typically going to back to the mainstream versus alternative media de debate. And as I was working as a journalist in mainstream media, I know what the checks are. I know how they are working with the fact, what, the, what needs to be checked before you can write a sentence. Uh -huh. And it's a big difference compared to some online blogs where everybody can write anything they want. Like the, the, the mainstream media has process for, for data, for, me, for information. Online media, you never know. And that guarantees at least somewhat uh, the probability of truth. And especially if they make mistake, they will probably admit it. Yeah. They will try to correct their mistake because that's what is taking down their credibility. So they will be trying to come up with the truthful information at the end. Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm guessing it's, it's easier to sort of differentiate the, the truth versus fake when it comes to written stuff, but I'm guessing it's a bit harder when it comes to images. 
to me even it's sometimes hard to see if it's fake or not like especially with those like influencers like, have you seen them they they look like normal people it's true but the other thing is if you I think the trend started in China where these influ AI influencers are being used instead of real influencers that were already there on the market, but they wanted to run their show 24 seven and sell stuff in TV or online. And that's not possible for human. You need to sleep, you need to eat, you need to do other stuff. So they started using these models. And if you were watching them for a longer time, you saw the mistakes because the model can imitate your moves, can imitate a lot of your uh, somehow like uh, appearance, uh -huh. but it cannot do everything. And sometimes some specific move and then you can see that the ear gets blurred or something gets like messed up in, in the appearance. But you have to be really looking for it. You have so... to be looking for it. And especially with the pictures and deepfake info, the thing is, we often only have a little bit of time, a little bit short video, short audio for a minute or a minute and a half, where none of those things can happen. And with pictures, you saw probably a Pope in his Balenciaga oh, yeah. jacket and everything. Love if it. you looked for the details, his hands were actually leaking or whatever. Yeah. They, they were totally blurred. The, the cross he had in, in, on his chest was also looking very fake. You, you could see the details. Yeah, you, you, could, you could see, like, when, when those pictures came out, I remember thinking, oh yeah, this is fake. But that was like months ago. And the difference that these models have made in just that short amount of time is just astounding. Like, exactly with the Pope pictures, like, yeah, you can be like 90% sure. Like 90% of people knew that they were fake. But like nowadays, it's getting so good that it can, I can, it almost tricked me, right? And the thing is, people actually don't, it, it doesn't matter if 90% of people can say this is fake. It's often about those 10%. Because let's say general election. If there is a deep fake video or audio of some candidate that is trying to win the election, and you use this type of technology to sway 2% of those voters, it can be enough to lose him the election and change the outcome for the whole country. So the problem isn't that most people will not see that it's fake. The problem is that even the minority doesn't see the difference. And I don't know what's the solution, but I think in the future, what we are looking at is going to be AI against AI. So we'll probably really? come up with some algorithms that will be designed to look for those small details for those problems and point them out. So you're watching the video and you will be having an, let's say, extension in your browser that will be looking at every picture, every video that is being played to you. And if there is something that doesn't add up, that looks fake or looks generated, or there will be some small pixel that is hidden there, the poison data that, that I mentioned before, it's just going to highlight it for you so that you know that this is a deep fake or it will write it down on the right side of the, of the picture. But that way we're taking the human element out of it, which you said was very important. It's important, but it's not deciding uh, human lives or it, it's not military, it's not healthcare, okay. it's not government. I mean, those so are this things. This would be fact checking. Yes. And I don't think we can keep the human element in, especially because there is so much information, so much de de data that is flowing every day. There is no way that the humans can be kept in loop. Even if everybody in the whole world would be looking at every piece of data, we would not have the human power to do it. So that's why I think the algorithms will have to come into play. The other thing is probably we will keep the human element in the most crucial stories. Uh -huh. So if there is a new war that broke out, Ukraine, Israel, and in Gaza, stuff like this. When it happens, we'll always have people on the ground, journalists and some non-governmental entities, uh, UN and organizations like this who will be looking at those events and giving us some impartial information about what's happening on the ground. So there will be human element in the most crucial stuff. But for the day-to-day -day small information that just flies through the internet, I guess using the AI to check AI stuff or to look for AI stuff, it should be something that can be very useful. It can help us to fact check and to avoid the fake stuff. Who should be building these fact checkers? Should it be 
the lawmakers, the nations, or should it be some international organizations, cybersecurity companies? What, who should they be? Governments are usually very good at these things, right? <laughs> no, I'm, I'm making fun of it. Uh, re regulators and governments are typically very slow to react to new trends, to new technology. We see that with AI as well. Uh, I think the European Union is the only one that is coming up with regulation that should regulate AI in quite big extent. Otherwise, I don't think, and, and that's because EU was working on that type of leg legislation for years now. So they already had a draft and they just tried to add the generative element to it and to try to react to the new trend. But nobody else uh, has been at that stage. So right now, EU is going to be the one leading the mm -hmm. regulation action. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, uh, they should be involved and in saying, these are the ground rules. This is something that the AI cannot be used for. These are the limits where we want to keep it in human hands and we don't want to give the control away. Uh, if you're asking me about the algorithms, I think it's gonna be private sector is gonna be building these. It would be nice if it was in conjunction with academia because universities have a lot of smart people who have the time and don't have the financial incentives behind it. So they are not doing this for a financial gain, but trying to do something interesting, trying to find something new. And if these two uh, sides or these two sectors are joined in the effort, I think there is a good chance that there might be a good algorithm that is going to help us that, that will have oversight. Ideally, if there is a lot of partners. The more partners you have in this, the more eyes, the more feedback, and it can be really great in the end. Mm. I know f at least about one private company slash research facility that is working on something like this already. So I think it's just going to grow in scale, like you said, to yeah, to 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 cover the day to day. I know, I know that there is a in Slovakia there is yeah. an institute that's working yeah. on such thing. It's exactly the one I was thinking of. But the thing is, I guess if you would look in every country, you would find somebody who's working on this, and it would be nice to pull all those uh, researchers and all those algorithms they come up with, and compare them to each other yeah. and find the best elements and put it together into one algorithm that is going to perform well. And we need to test it, of course, and but. And that should be, in the end, free for everybody. So it should be a free tool that will be incorporated into your browser or into something that you are using on a daily basis. AI, fact checker, AI, reverse AI, and then I'm guessing a bunch of others oh, yeah. <laughs> all working together. But that's actually the positive side of the things. We want to develop these types of algorithms that can address daily challenges that we have. Because with AI, we generated a lot of problems, but we can also generate a lot of solutions. So that's what we should be looking at and not only cry that we spilled the milk, like, okay, we, we release these types of models and it's just gonna be a hell of a time and we're just gonna be living in a nightmare. No, it's not gonna be like that. There will be positive and negative things coming down. As with everything. Let's move on to those deep fakes and, and, and generated images and how those can be misused in, in certain special situations. Um, there has been quite a lot of boom, I'm going to say, about types of extortion where AI is being used to um, convince people to do certain things or pay certain sums or whatnot. So can you tell me a bit more about a very specific one, is extortion, and what it is and how it works? There has been a warning by FBI that this is a growing trend. Cyber criminals figured that you can use deepfake models to generate new videos and you can use them and train them on very little material. So you just use a few pictures or a short video that you shot of yourself and put on social media, most of us have, and you can just take that, give it to the model, and the model can be trained to deliver a pornographic material with your face and it's not you in those shots, but your but face is like there you. and it, it might look like you. Mm -hmm. If the attacker is skilled enough, they will even try or train the model to look for the similar figure of your body or something like this. So it looks more believable. And when they have the material, they can use it for extortion. So they will send it to you and tell you, 
if you don't pay us, I don't know, thousand euros or thousand uh, dollars in such and such time frame, we will release this video online and it's going to destroy you. And we can also deliver it to all of the people around you. So your friends, your family, your partner, your company, and it's going to mess up with your reputation. It's a scary scenario, which actually has been uh, highlighted in Black Mirror maybe 10 years ago. There was an episode that was called Shut Up and Dance. Mm -hmm. But even there, I would argue it was a better scenario because uh, there really? was... Because was... usually that series just goes for it <laughs> when it comes to catastrophe. That's true. Uh, in this case, it was uh, this young guy who was watching something online, something mm -hmm. pornographic. He enjoyed it thoroughly. And somebody was actually in his computer, infiltrated. They infected his computer with some malware and it recorded him with the camera that was built into the computer. And they used that information to extort him to do increasingly bad stuff. In the end, I think he fights somebody in, in the woods. Not sure if he kills them or not, doesn't matter. But it gets worse and worse with every scene. Today, the thing is, you don't even have to do in, anything in front of the camera. You don't have to compromise yourself. They just okay. use something that is benign, legitimate, normal stuff that you publish online. They take it and build something malicious out of it and then use that to extort you. And if you are a popular person or uh, let's say an actor in Hollywood, there's so much material on you outside that you can they can just take from the internet, from YouTube or from some cutouts and use it to train the model and then claim that this is you. And for you to de no, no decline or say that this never happened, it's really a big, it, it's a lot it's of difficult. effort for you to deny this, that it happened. It's in any way possible to prevent your images being stolen or used in a malicious way? There is a way because you can always say who can see your content online. So when you are publishing something on social media, you can set it up in a way that it's private, that not many people have access and it doesn't pop up on some public news feed where everybody can see it. So that's one way how to manage it. You can also send that type of content only via chats, which is, again, a smaller, closer group that you can manage better. But the risk is still there because if, uh, for example, it's your partner, you're sexting with them. And it's a thing that can go bad because the not all relationships hold and it has a bad ending, then the partner can want to do, uh, want to use it for revenge and they can use it to train the model or just take the sexting, the, the pictures, make screenshots of it. Even if they disappear, you can, if they have a screenshot, they have it stored in their device. mobile phone, device, tablet, whatever it is. And they have it stored there as their own image. Because when it's a screenshot, it's a screenshot of the device. It's not the picture that you sent originally. Yeah. So every time you're sending something online, you're giving up some kind of control you need to understand that. So that should be the main driver behind your decision and always think, okay, is this something that I really need to post or want to share, want to send? And then also evaluate who are you, who is the person you are sending this to? Because if it's you, a group of your friends and you are sending them a picture of you in some vacation, that's probably fine. Yeah. It's probably not going to cause any problems. But again, the sexting thing can be it has so many pitfalls that I would avoid sexting completely if possible. Mm. I understand we are living in an age where this is a normal thing for yeah, most people. Yeah, distance relationships and whatnot. Yeah. Yes. So a lot of people are using it to keep their relationships alive. Still, it can have many pitfalls, risks that yeah. you should understand and you are accepting them when you are sending those types of uh, images, videos, whatever it is. So as I'm understanding it is as soon as you post it publicly or even non-publicly sometimes, you are giving up that control. So there is no way for you to stop some model or some malicious actor to use it in whatever way they deem. It's true, but I would not name uh, malicious actors or models as the first thing. For me, okay. the, the biggest risk is 
actually your relationship. So the, the person okay. who are you're, you're talking to, and you always need to understand that the person you are sending it to is the first person who can misuse it or send it further, spread it further, make a screenshot, make a recording of the video, because you can also record, you can play a video and record your screen. Yeah. So again, you can do something like a screenshot of, of the video. So I would say that's the most common risk. So ex-partners and relationships, that's the, the biggest risk that you're running. And of course, if that stuff is available online somewhere publicly, then it's also available to models for scraping or to the attackers who are looking for this type of stuff. And they are good if it's official, uh, if it's openly available. We have seen cases, for example, in Germany where uh, the attackers used a voice clone and some combination of social engineering to lure out almost a quarter a million euros from a company and they paid them. So they they Wait. were waiting for a moment when the CEO wasn't available. They acted as if they were the CEO, asked the financial department to make the payment, and they did, because the voice sounded very genuine and, un and believable. So can it be used in any way for sextortion, or is it just used in these business settings? I would say these business settings are actually more interesting than the sextortion. Okay. The sextortion thing is for let's say targeting regular Joes, mm -hmm. because you can get to anybody on that level, but people don't have that much money. They have maybe a few thousand euros, maybe 10,000 of euros, but it's still a lot of work to get that money out. But with the company, with one hit, as I said, quarter million, that's a lot of money for not that much effort, yeah. if that works. And as I said, we have seen these types of attacks already happening in the wild and the companies are paying or not paying but making the mistake and paying so we can say that ai is changing the cyber criminal uh, landscape it is it is and it will be transforming it on many levels this is just one of them i would say with generating new malware we're gonna see these models being used more and more right now we can say that there is an increase in phishing and sextortion emails which are text-based and are easily generated by these models. And also these models are very good at translating those things. So mm -hmm. you can target also uh, regions, areas, countries, languages that were not targetable before because they were not, the, the translation services online were not as good as these models. Yeah. So we will probably see attack patterns being ported or so also to smaller nations, smaller languages that we have never seen before. But phishing and sextortion or extortion in any 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 sense have been around for even before AI was such a common thing. But are there any other attacks that have sort of surged as 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 this new technology has been introduced to the public? I mean, if you are looking at the real threats that we already see happening in the wild, I would say the voice, voice cloning used for misinformation, disinformation, that's something that we already see. Same thing with videos and pictures and the deepfake technologies extortion that we have been talking about, there are already warnings by the authorities that this is happening to, to, to regular people, to companies, to a lot of people outside. So I would say these are the threats that are new or mostly leveraging this new technology. But we expect also the old type of threats such as malware, malicious emails, phishing, uh, phishing websites, of course, uh, and extortion in many ways, these are going to also use the so use it for the social engineering part because the model can write a really nice sentence, really polish it, make it uh, strong for the impact and find the, to, to use it to generate this type of uh, content. Mm -hmm. So I'm guessing it can also make it uh, look more believable, uh, easier for the human mind to not recognize that it's, it is malicious intent. Yes, and what we expect to be happening in the future, for example, some of the attackers can infiltrate your computer, they can steal all your email communication and use it to train the model to answer as if it was you or somebody you were talking to and make it very believable because they can even inject it into your old conversation with that person. And when the model understands how the other person is writing to you, what's their style, what's their grammar, even with some small mistakes, 
And this all can be replicated by the model and the attack can be very effective in this way. I guess that's where it, where it becomes not difficult but scary when the models deliberately make mistakes to sound more like humans or like a particular person. That to me is like, that's where it gets like really scary to me. It's again, it's just a pattern for the model. So I know, for, but for it, like, it doesn't, for us as humans, that's the emotional level that it yeah, scares you. Exactly. It makes you, makes you uneasy. For the model, it's just another statistical thing that is happening in the text and it can understand that this is what the person is doing. It's always, he, this person is always making this mistake in this word, it will do the same mistake. Yeah, but it, in a lot of people's minds, I, I, I think when, when you think about these generated texts, you're like, oh, they're going to be grammatically perfect because that's what it was trained on, like all these rules and how it how certain words should be used and the tonality and everything. But then when you see something with like deliberate mistakes to make it sound more human like that, like that's the sort of level I'm talking about is like it, that's where it becomes. And you know what the difference is? I don't want to know. <laughs> it's one prompt. Make a what? few mistakes. That's, how, that's so easy. That, yeah, that's how easy <laughs> it is for the attackers. Right now, they can say, write an email for this person based on their communication and also include a few mistakes that they typically do. Just a small thing in the prompt and the model can do it. Okay, I know what my next nightmare will be. Thank you. Uh, You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> we have a few of those. <laughs> um, is there any way that we can combat these threats to AI? That this threats that AI is not bringing, but perfecting, let's say? We are aware of the risks, so we are trying to address them. The thing is the cybersecurity side has been using machine learning for years now. In our case, it has been since 90s actually, for yeah. some types of threats. So of course, AI and AI-based models will be used to identify these types of threats. But again, if it's coming from a legitimate email, legitimate address, it looks like your email because the language fits. There is not much that the, let's say, anti-phishing, anti-spam can do about this, some, this type of technology because everything on the attack looks legitimate. So the only way out to know that there is something bad going on would be a malicious link that has been included or malicious uh, attachment that is trying to download something or run something in the background that we know that is malicious. So if the malicious activity is happening somewhere in the computer, if you have the security solution, there is a way how to address it, mm -hmm. but only at the point of the attack itself. Right now we are quite capable of uh, filtering out all the bad emails or the phishing emails because we see that this email contains something malicious right away, or there's some pattern that we have seen in the attacks before. That's probably gonna be less and less prevalent in the future, thanks to these models that can generate also new emails, new wordings, change the pattern every now and then. No, okay, moving on. So what it sounds to me from everything we've talked about today is that AI is a great tool, they can help a lot, but it's also quite scary and it seems to be scary on every level. Like I'm talking from kids to enterprises and, and, and multinational organizations. So I think the regulators will have a lot to work on and those fact checkers that we talked about should be really useful for, for everybody. Um, one positive thing that AI has brought us up to this point, what would it be? I would say effectivity. Even now I can say from my own per, uh, experience and from people that I know and have around me, this technology can make or take down your workload a lot. It can help you generate new stuff, new content, new code, for example, and you can work only on the details. So before it was 80% of the time you spent on the, the basic drafting, those 80% you can now, I would not say scratch, but shorten it. Outsource. <laughs> outsource it kind of to the, to the model. And it can give you a really good basis on which you can build. But don't expect the model to give you the final product, never. You always need to check it. If it's a code, you need to check for vulnerabilities, for bugs, if it's compatible, if it's uh, useful for what you actually intended it. 
So for, for the code, there is a lot of things to check with content, especially videos, texts, you just need to check so that it has the feeling of you as a human behind it, because the, these models are generating in based on statistics. So it's going to look very generic to, to the reader and they can identify that this was written by the machine. So you always need to add your, I don't know how to say it, but smell to the text so that it is you, the human that is sitting behind the desk and who helped put this text, to, to text uh, or content together. So it's not just artificial intelligence, but you need to have also human intelligence incorporated into it. It should be a mix. And yeah. that mix can be very uh, beneficial for even for the people who are consuming the content, because it can be more content, but more interesting, more to the point, more effective without all the words that you don't need because the, the, the model can write it really effectively and short. And you can say this needs to be 400 words. It's going to be 400 words. It's not going to be longer. It's not going to be shorter. You can fit into the frame the way you need it. Well, at, at least that's a, a good positive thing about everything that we've talked about today. So I want to thank you for coming today for explaining everything or at least the part that we covered today. Um, hope to see you sometime again in the future, if you wouldn't mind. And to everyone watching, you should say something as well. Thank you for <laughs> <laughs> thank you for having me here. I um, hope that the information is useful to everybody who watches this I'm podcast. I'm sure it will. And to everyone watching, thank you for being with us today. Make sure you follow us on all of our social media and follow WeLiveSecurity.com and Safer Kids Online, where we talk not just about AI but all topics discussing children and their safety online. Thank you and I hope to see you next time. <laughs>